Hello, welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin, and this is the show where you can have your property related questions answered by our team of property experts. And joining me today is Richard Murray, CEO of Eurolink Technology, suppliers of Vico property management software. Welcome, Richard. Thanks, Stephen. And joining Richard is Jack Roberts, CEO of Sloth Move, property tech innovators. Welcome to you, Jack. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, right, well, we'll get right on with the questioning. And Richard, we're going to start with you. I have a small residential estate agency. And for better or worse, you're going to love this, we use a Cardex system for both vendors and applicants. Whilst I'm tempted to upgrade to a computerized system, I am extremely concerned about my obligations and responsibilities read data protection laws. Can the experts explain to what extent I would be required to undertake the various obligations? Is that okay. an easy one? Um, <laughs> I remember the sort of the, the or heard the roller deck. Is it roller decks brand? <laughs> brand? I yeah. don't know. Yeah, car no. decks. I'm not sure. Um, I think this sounds like more of a case of uh, being afraid of change or resistant to change rather than. Is this about moving from my card-based system to a, well, that's a digital... typical property market isn't it? to a degree? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, it, and they, they, I wouldn't have thought there's many agents still using that sort of th those sorts of systems to record data. Um, but I think what what I would probably recommend is is literally just going on a kind of digital transformation um, because I think they probably really need to because their competitors will have done. I would imagine it's safe to say. So there comes a time where you, 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 you know, you're really going to get behind, behind the curve here. I think the crutch of the question was, was data. Mm. And, and, well, and data protection. Data, yeah. data protection, and, and, and Jack's probably better place to, to talk about that than me. But what I would probably suggest is whether you're recording data on a card or you're recording data in a, in a, in a software platform, you've still got the same responsibilities you've still got the same uh, legislation to 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 comply with and a sort of duty of care really apart from always that. a duty there's always a duty of care but i think you know so gdpr is you know what is, is five or six years in now um 2018 i just you know it it, it, it it's something that that really software houses like ours um the the cornerstone of gdpr is is privacy by design so our systems had to be designed, as I'm sure yours is, to, uh, to comply with that legislation or make sure that our agent clients do comply with that, that legislation. So if it's, if it's all built into a, a software platform like ours or, or, or others, then that's going to help this agent, I think, remain compliant. And obviously, they'll have the benefit of that digital transformation and all the benefits and and and. and compliance and just just you know efficiency i think when when you put in a software system to a firm of agents for example where where does the legal responsibility lie is it still his responsibility or her responsibility to comply with the law or, or can he cite you as the sort of dependent party if you like or dependent on you I think it depends where the data is coming from. If you're moving the data from a system that's not GDPR compliant, then we would have to go through a process with that client as part of a data migration project that would help cleanse that data and, and make sure that that person has is allowed to hold that data. And how, how would that manifest itself? What, what, what do you actually mean? So, so, okay, I've got a list of clients here, list of vendors, list of applicants. You come in, put the software system in. So what have you got to do to, to, to make that data compliant? You need to make sure you've got the right permissions. Right. And that can, that, that can be as difficult as it, as it sounds. Mm. Mm. Um, I would imagine in recent years, most agents would be very familiar with this legislation. They will be compliant with the legislation. Um, but if you're bringing in historical data, then absolutely, yeah, it could be a series of uh, a, a, an email campaign, for example, making sure that you you engage those users and make sure that they know that their their data is being held and what their options are, because you can you've got the right to be forgotten, um, but also you've got to be able to transport that data as well. If someone says, "I want to know everything that you know about me," 
from a data perspective, then you need to be able to provide that. You need to be able to transport that data um, to, to, that, uh, to that requester. So it's, yeah, the short answer is it's not easy. The longer answer is it forms part of a very detailed data migration project, taking you from a Cardex system or a legacy software through to a, a modern day um, CRM type system that would have all of that, as I said, privacy by design built in. Okay. Jack, I'm sure you've got something to say on this. No, I think that's a really, really good point. I think you know, from a GDPR data protection perspective, they are, they are absolute hard and red lines. I think there's a question about how well do some organizations understand them. I mean, if I think about our business as a good example, um, you know, we think a lot about not only what is a law, but actually what is the right thing to do from a data ethics perspective, actually, in terms of that transparency and being clear with customers and treating data, actually, as you would want your own data to be treated. So I think it's fundamental. I think you can also, to some extent, predict the kind of legislative trend with data. And it's better to kind of, I guess, optimize towards that point to stop kind of multiple system migrations and overhauls of all your data practices. So it's always better to be as transparent, as clear, and down the line as you possibly can do. So you're not constantly reinventing these systems every three to five years. Mm -hmm. And, oh, and if you're, if you're, you know, when you're inputting data, you know, the system should be creating that kind of pop-up asking for consent, you know, promoting good habits. That's what the, that's how software should help uh, the users. Yes. One of the things I've always been a bit confused about, I mean, if you just take perhaps the rental market as, a, as an example, let's say you get a tenant go into arrears. Um, the agent's tried his best and failed. You as a landlord, you've made the odd phone call and failed. Obviously, collectively, you've got the tenant data on file. What happens then? Is it permissible to pass that data to a debt collection agency, for instance? Is, is it transferable legitimately? Yeah, because you, because you, you have a legitimate right to hold that data, and particularly when it comes to accounts and accounting uh, transactional data. So you have, uh, you have a right to hold, hold that data for a period of time. Right. There, might have, there might have been a request to be forgotten and you can anonymize that data at a certain point in time, but you need to retain the transactional data. Otherwise, your whole agency's balances will be completely out of sync. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I mean, revenue is one case, isn't it? Revenue might want to, want to inquire into, into the complexity of the transaction. Yeah. Or alternatively, say perhaps a debt, mm -hmm. a debt collection agency might want to, and they're, they're both legitimate reasons. Absolutely, so. and it can't be used to, to hide from, from one's obligations no, no. Uh, in, in, in a contractual mm. situation such as that, yeah. such as paying rent in, in, within an AST. So really, you know, I think Jack's point is right, you know, um, law, law or not, if you, if you act in an ethical way, then it's just going to come right anyway, isn't it? Uh, yeah, but obviously that, you know, as, as Jack also said, there's red, you know, there's very there's hard red lines, red lines between, yeah. you know, in, in terms of legislation. <laughs> okay. And enough time has gone by now, Stephen, that there's enough case law that that it, it, to look at, yeah, yeah. to look at as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on from the red lines. And Jack, having struggled to get on the housing ladder, I've been renting for the last seven years. I'm hearing a lot about the expectation that house prices could significantly drop this year. Can the panel please tell me what I should be doing in respect of preparing myself for this potential opportunity? And I'm thinking here probably, I'm going back to my youth, when, when you sort of got loans in principle from building societies and things like that. I don't know, I don't know what preparatory work you'd do today, do you? Well, I, th I think the, the, the first call would be the kind of presupposition that house prices will go down. They, they may and they may not. I think that's the first point to call out. If I'm a first time buyer, I'm probably a little bit more agnostic about the timing. Obviously, you don't buy at a peak, but I think that's important to call out. So assuming this individual's question's got their you know, the deposit, they want the right kind of schemes, get the right kind of tax efficiencies, I think if you've been renting for a long period of time, two big shifts you're going to experience moving to the property market. A is going to be, you know, you're going to have to create a emergency fund for that property because, you know, the saying goes, if it can go wrong, it, it probably will do at some point. Um, and then actually creating room for that new budget. So, you know, your financial commitments are going to change is the first bit. In terms of the actual purchasing, I think, I'm sure you, you might agree with this, is knowing your market is really important. You know, going out and seeing properties, even if, you may not necessarily buy it just to understand because you don't know what it is that you want until you've seen enough properties. Mm. So getting out into the streets, understanding the market, getting to know the agents better and making sure that you've got enough financial leeway because you don't want to be in a position where you just kind of get in there. I think those would be the, the two or three kind of broad trends that I would focus on. Okay. 
Um, I, 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 I suppose, you know, looking at your deposits, looking at the funding um, and sort of stress testing yourself to some degree is quite important. But um, I think we're heading for a time again, rentals seem to be going through the roof across the country. It's not just in one particular area. And we're going to be back in the situation where renting is actually becoming more expensive than buying, leaving aside the deposit. And I think that's going to confuse the market somewhat. I don't know what you guys think. A recession, yeah. We typically see the, the rental market start to boom, um, which, yeah, is, is not, not necessarily good or, or, or a bad thing, um, depending on the outcomes. I still don't believe, as I've said before, that we're, we're heading into a price crash scenario here. Um, Jack's made a good point. You know, 70% of the market, the moves are a need, on a needs must basis. You know, divorce, first time buyers, moving job, moving areas. Um, it's, it's that typically that 30% of, of speculative investor type business that, that drops off uh, in, in, the, in, you know, in these sorts of difficult times. Um, and, a fa- and with a, a, a shortage of stock as well. I just think the UK is just in that perpetual kind of yeah. cycle of not enough stock, too much demand, so a price crash doesn't doesn't seem like um, it's on the cards, in my opinion. Mm. It, it, it's such a good point because with that triple whammy, right? When I, I have friends trying to get onto the property ladder, they experience this. They've got the rising cost of living, which diminishes their affordability. Then we've got rising interest rates. Then actually, the typical living expenses, like like energy, is a good example, is also increasing. So not only are rates less favourable your lending capacity is diminished quite significantly. And obviously we've had that property price increase over the last sort of 12, 18 months. And it's just all a recipe to make it really difficult at the moment to get in the market. So you have to feel for buyers that are trying to transition into that, into that space. And on top of that, we've got food inflation at almost 17%. So there we are. Okay, yeah. that's all we've got time for in this half of the show. So join me again after the break when we'll be asking Jack and Richard more of your questions. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and I'm joined by Richard Murray and Jack Roberts. Welcome back. Richard, your second question. I've worked for a national estate agency for the last 15 years in a relatively small town in the south of England. I can see a huge amount of ways that we could offer a better service and often find myself frustrated by the company who are unwilling to listen to any ideas or adopt change. I'm therefore thinking of starting my own agency. Could the panel tell me if they were in the same position as me? Any key pieces of advice or pitfalls to avoid when doing so? Or should I just stay where I am? Okay, um, obviously it's a, a big life decision that's about to be made. I think any startup comes with its its significant challenges mm-hmm. and 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 you've got to be prepared for that that bumpy road that that a startup uh, brings with it. Um, I, I can understand where they're coming from. Um, we work with national agents, but I see the other side of it, um, and that is without process and, and 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 protocol. That's that's the only way a large corporate can have any level of control of their business, and. If you, you know, when you want to implement change, it, it's hard. It's it's slow in a, in a in a large corporate. And if that's frustrating this person, then then yeah, that I I understand that. I can I can empathise with it. However, I would I would ask them to consider what their plan is. So if they can offer a better service, great. How are they going to do that? Because think about the support you get in a corporate. You've got regional offices and regional hubs that are probably doing a lot of your admin for you. They're probably doing your property management for you. Definitely doing your client accounting for you. I mean, that, that's three, I think I've just mentioned three or four probably really big areas of that service that this person is referring to that I, I'm sure they would have considered because they'll know their industry. They'll know what goes into that service end to end. But I just, I just encourage a, a real review of, of what that would look like um, in, a, in, a, in a startup. Um, I, would, I would make sure that 
they take some really good legal advice. I um, suggest they take some general legal advice on their employment contract and what they can and can't do because opening up down the road from a big corporate, you know, you can't take your data with you. You can't take your contacts with you. Um, I would imagine there'll be some restrictions. So I would, I would, I would strongly recommend taking some legal advice there. I'd recommend taking more sector um, based legal advice as well. Definitely choose the right software. I'm, I'm going to say that obviously, but what I would say is the software that you used within the corporate might not be the right software for you in a startup. Sure. Very much depends how quickly you're going to scale, how quickly you want to scale, how quickly you can afford to scale. Um, thinking about that, obvious things, business plan, I would say take particular notice of startup costs and cash flow. I think it hit a very good point there. I mean, I can remember sort of 15, 20 years ago being in agency and we, we had a policy, we'd never start anything from scratch because you're probably, to create a good agency situation from scratch, we fit out all the, all the supplemental costs. You're in the hundreds of thousands of pounds before you know where you are. Yep. And unless you've got that capital, you're just going to be starved of capital and then starved of the facilities that you need to operate successfully, whether it's software or, 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 or anything else. And, as, and so we always used to look for businesses that perhaps weren't successful that we, we, we could perhaps Turn inject around. something into to make it successful mm. and pick it up fairly cheaply that way. And it's, a, it's probably a cheaper way of doing it. But again, if he's an employed situation, I think you're absolutely right. He's got to be very careful about his contractual obligations. And they're probably not going to take that kindly if he does open in the area that they've been serving anyway. Anything to add to that, Joe? And I think they're both really good points, especially your point around about actually, do I need to start up or can I acquire a fledgling business that mm. I believe, this individual believes they can have a lot of value to? I think is a really interesting question. Uh, and I think you're so right. The first priority needs to be just getting the regulatory and contractual bits. And that situation is clearly understood so you can understand. And I think I'd say that, I just say that's amazing. And I really applaud the kind of ambition to do that. And, and I'm, I'm sure it'll be great success and we'll, we'll see them on the high street soon. And well, we'll know in a year's time or so, won't we? <laughs> <laughs> there, there we are. Okay, uh, Jack, your question. Uh, the property industry seems, still seems to be one that is reluctant to adopt technology to make its life easier for the people it's serving. Why do you think this is? And what would you say would be the easiest changes that could be made right now to make the whole process of purchasing a property or moving simpler? I think I know what you're going to be saying on this one. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a good question. There's a lot of uh, points to make. And I think the, fir the first point to make would be like, and we, we discussed this earlier, right, that the UK generally, the kind of relocation technology sector is in advance, it is in other countries. Now, if you think about the whole moving cycle, the one of the things that we realise is that actually a lot of the friction, yes, there's a lot of confusion about the whole process, but there's a lot of friction around that point of move because that's where your admin and requirements are typically at the highest. You've got to do, you know, dozens and dozens of address updates, dozens of conversations, all that sort of stuff. So I feel there seems to be a little bit of a general reluctance to adopt new technologies from different partners because of you know, just disposition for change. They want to do what they're already doing. There's a million different things to consider. I feel that if these businesses look at innovative technologies like, you know, it's Lothman, which is disrupting its space, they can really kind of revolution and create a, a really sort of new USP for their business. So I think actually in quite a crowded market, it's quite important. Okay. But I mean, I suppose all these administrative things that you talk about, I suppose they're all at the time sort of an interference to the dream, aren't they? You know, you, you, you've gone through the process of choosing your property. You've got this dream of how it's going to be and what it's going to look like and what your new life's going to be about. And then you've got all this dreary admin to That's deal right, with, yeah. haven't you? I mean, I think anybody that, like yourselves that come along and sort of help solve that, it's got to be, got to be useful. And I think... I, I don't know many agencies that have taken that sort of attitude up. Do you, Richard? I don't know. Well, I think, again, from a consumer perspective, as Jack said, you know, saving someone a lot of time at what is a very stressful and busy time, bear in mind you've still got your life to continue, your business as usual, I guess. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know, what the, I don't know what the answer is to why we, we haven't, you know, our, our, the sector doesn't uh, adopt technology as, as quickly as others. I think maybe it comes down to, it's just 
a generational thing. I mean, you look at all these brands, and you know a lot of these the brands in our in our sector. They've been around for generations, literally generations. You know, when some of our corporate clients go and buy a local brand, they don't stick their corporate header above the door. They maintain that brand, or at the very least, they maintain the name. And I think a lot of it comes down to that. I think it, com it comes down to this, these, these brands that we see, we've seen our whole lives, and so have our parents, and in some cases, of our parents' parents. So I, I don't know whether it's that, it's, there's some sort of deep sort of subconscious influence on us in the UK that we, that, that's why we, you know, we, we want to sort of keep things traditional. Yes, I can, I can remember years ago attending a sort of seminar where our, our managing and senior partners were at and we had all these lectures about chasing all the new money in the city and it went on for nearly all day and one of our senior partners stood up at the end, who was, I have to say, probably coming to the end of his career and sort of said, Yes, absolutely lovely, but you know, I think we'll stick with the old money. <laughs> I, think, I, I think everybody just sort of deflated, yeah, yeah, killed, <laughs> killed the day, yeah. just absolutely yeah. killed the day in a sentence. But uh, no, I, I think you're right. There, there, there does seem a reluctance mm. to, to 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 change, and especially by the big firms. And I suppose, in in in, in one way, it, it's satisfaction of shareholders, isn't it? And when you're when you're a huge huge company and perhaps worldwide or europe wide very difficult to instill change isn't it yeah but and, but ultimately it's a people business and i talk about that a lot as uh, you know with, with my prop tech hat on you know we we exist to support a people business and it's really important to to me that, that we always consider that and again that's why slower in, in in adopting technology because you've talked about it a lot that one-to-one -one, that conversation that that help at that really difficult time, you know, moving forward from that to get the sort of technology that you guys are delivering. Again, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you use? And again, from a consumer perspective, why wouldn't you use that help? Because you've just been through that really difficult process. So it's yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one to to give you a definitive answer why why we're slow to to to, to adopt tech, but. Yeah, maybe a few insights there anyway. All right. Okay, well, look, just for the last 20 seconds each, um, I'm going to do what you hate is I'm going to say, get your crystal ball out. Jack, how do you see the market going for the rest of the year? The, in terms of the price of the property market? Just generally, yeah. If I had to make a prediction for what we're going to see later this year, I would suggest that I'd imagine, I think property prices, what I'm seeing from data, might stagnate or remain consistent. So I wouldn't expect any big changes, either up or down, but of course that can be completely wrong. Um, and subject to government policy and how the economy responds and the buying and purchasing power of the typical individual, I think will drive how the housing market changes in the last half of this year. That's a good political answer, well done. Yeah. Rich. <laughs> I thought I was the eternal optimist. Politician. I think uh, that's great. No, the optimist. <laughs> I, I love. That. I love that. No, I'm. I'm optimistic. I. I but. I, but. But I am by nature. So, um, optimistically, I, I don't think there's going to be a, a crash. I think we're looking at maybe somewhere around the five percent mark, maybe three percent at the high end, and I think that's coming down from a high bar. So actually, I think is a possible slight reset. Well, I. I don't think there'll be a crash unless, of course, we talk ourselves into it. But there we are. That's all we've got time for today. So big thank you to Richard Murray and Jack Roberts. Thank you both very much for coming in. Great answers to the questions. I'm Stephen Galpin. Join me again next time on Property Question Time.